Uh, I'll share my screen and we can see how that works. So this is the checklist right now. These are the EOF EAPs that we've been working on and the open issues. So the first one is just renaming all of the EOF EAPs to have this prefix. So I'm on. I are a little choppy. Can anyone hear Pavel or is it everyone? I think issue is on my side. Uh, okay. Ten more minutes, 10 more minutes. Yeah, I'll be, I'll be like in some better spot <clears throat> in 10 minutes. Okay, sounds good. Um, yeah, so I mean, in the meantime, uh, we can go ahead and start going through some of these things. The first one is more of just uh, operational thing having this EOF prefix for all of the EOF EAPs. I think this makes sense. There's a question, does this make sense for static relative jumps? I feel like it does for now because we're sort of considering all of these for Shanghai together as an atomic package. So we might as well just do this. And if later on, for some reason, this falls through, we can just remove it. Uh, I don't know if anyone thinks differently about that. I'm just going to add to the, the reason this came up because uh... There was no nice document like this listing out what is considered and you know like a entry point people could find all the yeah. information and so what people did they were rather grabbing for uf on eip study of the torque yeah. and which is currently not possible um all right makes sense i've been trying to push people to this page when i can as well just because i think that this is a good overview place but yeah it would be good just so they can grab through it so yeah if you guys want to accept this pr to make the modification that would be great uh first e to talk about is 3540 the object format v1 uh, first question move generic contract creation rules from 3670 <clears throat> So this is basically adding this logic about how to deal with transaction creation. Yeah, so I think from my point of view, it makes sense to actually move it. So the, yeah. the prerequisite only actually like copies it from the other one. Uh, but I think we can move most of this like generic logic, like how, how contract creation fails like when it fails like what is the gas cost of that because they are kind of general rules about tof yeah uh, for some reason i i don't even remember like it they end up in the second the second tip but i think that was already <laughs> seen as a confusion so <clears throat> that, that's later so um yeah I, i'm for like moving what's possible to the to the main one and I think the, the the code validation will be just uh, smaller because of that. So yeah, yeah, um, yeah, makes sense. I'm in favor of that. Um, okay, next we have a question about whether we should forbid EOF deploying legacy contracts. I think yes, but I'm also like very far on the spectrum of generally restricting what you know people can do with respect to legacy so i don't does anyone have an argument for allowing eof to deploy legacy contracts i think the main main question there is should rather be is there a use case where this is desired? And I think we asked this question a bunch of times and maybe there was some discussion around it at DevConnect. Yeah. But unless, unless there is a use case found which this would prevent and the use case would be important, I think it would likely simplify everything if this wouldn't be allowed. Right. 
And I think it's true to say that if we disallow it and later on want to, uh, you know, allow legacy contract creation, we don't have to bump the version. Whereas if we do allow legacy contract creation, we want to remove it. Yeah, we might end up breaking things if we remove it later. So it seems better to restrict as much as we can in the beginning and see if people request the functionality. Does EOF break legacy? EOF does not break legacy contracts. Okay, so I would say go forward. Let's go forward with this. And if anything comes up where people are saying they have a use case for it, we can discuss more. But I'd say let's just be restrictive in the default case. Okay, clarify overall code size limit still applies. I haven't looked at this, but I assume this is meaning overall is in like the whole EOF container, not the sum of the EOF code sections. Yeah, I don't think we modified the meaning of code size limit because yeah, that is done one step outside of this. Yeah. So my at least my assumption was that the overall um, I mean, what is called today code size limit, but we try to reframe it to container size limit. But basically, the, the current limit would apply to everything. Mm -hmm. um, but we did have a discussion, uh, both in the context of 30, uh, 3860 and EOF. Um, what if the limit would be changed? So what uh, 3860 says, it's the creation code uh, limit is twice of the deployed code limit. Um, and we were thinking, what if we would actually modify both of these to be slightly bigger than yeah. it is today? Um, that is like another discussion to be had at some point. Right. Yeah, that makes but sense. It was confusing. Confusion was about like what yeah what does it mean? Um, I think we we always intended to be like the, the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, but maybe that's. I guess we might need to read the the spec to make sure it's clear. Yeah. I mean, for that, I believe you need to investigate the origins of the limit, why the limit was introduced, and what it's supposed to uh, cover and restrict. Um, and I think it was more about straight state growth and not about like jump test analysis. Hmm. But if it would be only for covering like the jump test analysis, then of course it would make sense to say that it only covers the code section because that's the only one which would be affected. Yeah. Um, but the main question in this is, are we even open to complicate this uh, limit. Uh, so like EIP 170, are we open to complicate it such that it wouldn't cover everything but sections? And I think the likely answer is no, because that seems like seems like a, a quite a complex rule set. But maybe that that's something we, we have to answer. I would also agree that it would be better to avoid complicating this 170 rule set, at least for now. Um, but yeah, I guess I also was thinking that the code size limit was originally in place with the assumption that jump test analysis was not linear in cost. So in that sense, it would make sense to just do it over the, the code sections. But yeah, I think for now, my preference would be to just stick with what exists there and run the limit across the whole container. Yeah, uh, okay. I think it, it it was not only for that, but also the yeah. state growth because um, I think it's, it was state growth in the sense that some opcodes were not well priced and the bigger, with unlimited containers, you could craft much bigger code abusing those opcodes. So I don't think it was related to jump test, but it would be, yeah, we should really ask, you know, maybe Martin, 
you definitely sure. should know the answer um, to get an understanding, you know, why, why was the limit added? And that should answer this question too. Okay. Um, anything else on 3540 that we should discuss? Okay, 3670 UF code validation. We didn't mention this, but I assume that this uh, point will also involve removing the contract creation rules from the code validation. So the main thing to update with 3670 now is to reject the deprecated opcodes, call code. We you know, mostly already accept that that's going to be deprecated, has been deprecated for a long time. Self-destruct, I guess, is the more questionable thing. Should this be deprecated? Should it not be deprecated? Uh, what do people think about that? So I guess I, like- I internally express my opinion. Um, it's a call code. I'm definitely in favor of because mm -hmm. who needs call code? Um, Self-destruct, um, my opinion was that because that's still floating in the air. Um, I think a final decision of about that can only really be made once there's more clarity what the future of self-destruct gonna be. Um, but I'm leaning more towards, you know, just, just restricting, restricting it because it can be added later. Yeah, I was also leaning pretty hard in restricting it, but now I'm, like questioning slightly more with these people wanting to use this as like a um uh like a pay all type of op code and so e even if we do get rid of the self-destruct functionality of the op code and it's just send all i wonder if that's going to be a frustration i do still think the evm is better overall without it even if it's just pay all but i'm not sure if that will uh, upset developers but you know i think again like if, if we're coming from the mentality of more restriction in the beginning this is something that could be added back if people say you know on legacy we have self-destruct for send all we should have it on uf1 that can be added in a future hard fork um, isn't the only reason why self-destruct is on the on the legacy contracts currently is because it is probably going to break some contracts in the mainnet yeah the only reason we are not basically removing it is because we are afraid to break some things but with this format we are breaking a lot of things and i think should be okay just to remove it altogether yeah, yeah. and yes I, I'm... and yeah 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 i agree sometimes you just gotta like rip the band-aid off yeah this one was like should <laughs> we should have done that a long time ago right but yeah yeah I guess the argument is that if, I mean, there's still a likelihood there's still self destruct going to be modified in Shanghai, so the same hard fork. And if that happens, then the decision here likely has to be changed in light of that, you know, whatever the decision going to be. But if self destruct is left as it is in Shanghai, then I think restricting it is the best way forward. Sorry, if so, if no no changes made to self destruct, we should. If no sure. changes are made in the rest of the EVM for self destruct, okay. then EUF shouldn't allow it. But I think there's there's a hope that self destruct change is going to happen anyway. Yeah, and if it does, then uh, yeah, I mean, this is really just a note, you know, we have to keep in mind to review this. Yeah. Um, in both cases, we are removing self-destruct, but if self-destruct is basically renamed to move all, it's like different opcode in in other in any case. But yeah, I totally agree with that. Sounds good. Okay. Uh, anything else on thirty six seventy code validation?
Hi, Dano. Hi. Sorry I'm late. The calendar no clocked it over an hour later. So daylight yeah, I think yeah, I think Tim accidentally put it on at yeah, an hour later. And then I realized this morning. So I moved it to the correct time. Okay. Did I miss anything good? Um no, I don't I think we've just got I, I've recorded a couple of the things related to 3540 on this document, but generally this has all been accepted. So uh yeah, we just were finishing up 3670. If anyone has anything else, otherwise we can go to 4200. Okay, 4200 static relative jumps one point here there's a question should we calculate the offset of the relative jump from the current instruction position or should we calculate it from the next instruction position which is plus three bytes taking account for jumping over the off and its operand alex is in favor of the plus three that's because it's more favoring of jumping forward than backwards is that right yeah and the calculation is also yeah i mean in my mind it seems clearer um yeah and also like jump zero becomes a a, a no op in this case mm -hmm. uh, jump minus three becomes this. an infinite loop Jump what? Jump minus three becomes an infinite loop. Yep. I don't have a preference. Does anybody have a preference for changing the semantics to offset from current instruction? Yeah, I have I have side preference for like um the other way, uh, because just the EVM implementation is simpler, uh, but it's it's tiny, tiny difference. So I don't really care so much, but I kind of this plus three shows up <laughs> in some implementations. For sure. What do other opcode sets do for this? It's, it's nothing really like similar to this one, I think. There's not uh, relative jumps. But yeah, yeah. Well, I think J JVM has has it also from the like it's calculated from the instruction, I believe. But I'm not entirely sure. But I did some research on JVM uh, when I was comparing the verification. Daniel, do you want to maybe speak from Solidity's perspective, like in a similar viewpoint? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, the offset doesn't make much of a difference for us. We can generate code either way, so I don't mind that at all. <clears throat> General, we have been discussing for uh, or starting to discuss uh, whether we want to have the EIP extended by some jump table jump. I'm not sure whether we want to go into that. We're not entirely clear about that yet. Uh, but yeah, regarding the offset for us, not to just distract, uh, yeah, it doesn't matter to us. Okay. Um, I don't know how to make a decision on this right now. We're still at the plus three bytes. I think, you know, we should either keep it at that, or if somebody is able to point to a few other instruction sets that are doing it from the instruction itself or you know some other reasoning that we should seriously change it i think we should just stick with what we have i think there are two data points which can help make this decision so one is looking at the uh, once this is implemented in <clears throat> all of the vm clients um look at you know, which way uh, has more overhead from the EVM perspective. I mean, Pavel said that in EVM one, the current one has a slight overhead. Right. Um, but it would be nice to see it across all the different EVMs. So mm -hmm. that's one data point. Um, and I suppose likely we have to prefer um, the EVM interpreter perspective. Um, but the other data point could be some statistics from Solidity once this is implemented in Solidity, which is 
which is planned, um, you know, in this year. So mm -hmm. once it's, it's implemented in Solidity, we can collect some statistics of frequency between backward and forward jumps. Um, and that's like another data point, you know, which could help this decision. Okay. Um, but yeah, I think the EVM implementation has precedence because, you know, we want to make the EVM implementation simpler. Yeah, uh, makes sense. There, I think is definitely going to be an overhead for the plus three semantic, but it's, you know, just one addition. So you yeah, just have to decide. Um, yeah, is that worth it? <clears throat> Uh, okay, I wrote that note on there. Anything else on 4200 that people would like to discuss? Um, Java JSR does it from the instruction, not from the next instruction. So that's one point. Okay. Does anybody want to just go ahead and say we should change it right now, given that information, or we should just wait until we have the feedback that Alex pointed out? Um, let's just go ahead and change it unless we find a counterexample, because the overhead's in favor of changing it. Um, JSR and Java's in favor of changing it. Um, yeah. And that's two, that's pretty strong. I'm indifferent, I'm happy either way. Mm, so are there like any other <laughs> languages or like VMs we should check? I think like um, WebAssembly is kind of irrelevant because they they have much more sophisticated jump instructions based on labels. So I think it yeah. doesn't up like you just what's the name of microsoft's byte code clr something like that it's clr clr cil that's what i'm looking for i think we can yeah, we CLR? Can... but the byte code's <laughs> called cil Okay, let's loop back to this after we look at a couple other uh, some um, assembly. I think there's one more data point. So what, what Daniel mentioned, we have been discussing the jump table or like this yeah. jump V instruction. And there are many different questions around it. Um, namely, whether it should be dense or sparse, whether it should have the data as an immediate or in a section. Um, this depends on, on many questions we've been discussing, but and it would be nice to get more clarity on that. And I think we want to discuss that on Monday in terms okay. of its solidity. And that may also have like an influence on this because ideally, if you do end up having such an instruction, it should be following the same semantics as air jump. Um, so that may be another data point on it. Sounds good. Let's just loop back to this next week. Okay. Okay. I what guess then we, we will also, yeah, just uh, pro also try to join next week to discuss what we ended up with the solidity usage of jump table instructions and stuff like that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. 4200, uh, 4750. You know, functions. First thing is we set the call F and red F opcode numbers to B0, B1, I believe. That's what this change was for. Yeah, B0, B1, that's okay with everyone. Any, anyone against that? Okay, set gas cost for call F, right F. I don't know if there was a PR for this, but it's listed down here. Red F would be three gas, call F would be five gas. I haven't looked at the instructions enough lately to know, yeah, 
how these numbers feel, but I assume that they're okay. So, so the numbers in like the, the last section is kind of, I think they are a bit lower than we originally proposed, uh, but I did try to kind of analyze what's like micro, micro, I don't know, <laughs> Uh, micro instructions to actually the the implementation should do and yeah based that on this so it's like mostly like to give give some consistency but they are also like sophisticated i mean they are like think lower that some people might expect so i'm not sure this is not controversial but uh yeah i mean one uh, thing there from my side from solidity code generation is one of the issues with EOF functions is that it will make it hard for us to do bytecode level code deduplication because we can't jump across different functions. If the upcodes are as cheap as they are right here, then a conditional jump and a call together are still cheaper than a conditional jump that uh, a jump I, which will mean that even if we don't find a nice solution for the problem I'm thinking about next week, which we will try, even then it will not be harmful in that it will be more costly than what we had before. So that's an argument for these low values to be nice. But yeah. Yeah, that's one piece of feedback I've gotten. And yeah, you know, we'll talk about it or you guys will talk about it more with this jump table instruction, but um, some people were a little upset that the relative jumps because we can't jump to the dynamic location anymore was more expensive for their optimized bytecode. So keeping it cheap makes that a little bit better. Yeah, we're actually talking about um, three features in total. Uh, over the past like two weeks. So the mm -hmm. jump table is one, a conditional call is another one, and tail call is the last. Are um, these things that you want to try and also put in the suite? I think we want to do a bit more analysis from Solidus perspective to yeah. find out which is the, the best of these. Um, ideally, we don't want to put all of them because we yeah. still want to keep the surface relatively small. Um, but I could see, um, you know, the tail call or the, the conditional call, one of those two to become part of it. Okay. I'm leaning towards the tail call. Um, and the jump table obviously would be rather useful for many different cases, but that requires more analysis um, from Solidity's perspective. Yeah, I think we could live if we had to without either but i think both would be very good to have so but yeah we will get back to you once we played around with it a bit more next week okay sounds good i think like just generally the sooner we can have like some sort of spec or you know something introduced to all core devs the less that people will shout about more evm changes going in so just to like keep that in mind. Yeah, my plan was to draft up, um, maybe not an AIP, but at least a spec for these instructions. And uh, we want okay. to have like, some preliminary idea before next all code dev next week. Um, yeah, whether we yep. want to propose these or not. That would be great. <clears throat> okay, that was the gas class. The next one, redefine code section header to be an array of code section sizes. This, I think I opened this PR. Um, yeah, I think, I, I don't know, you guys can weigh in, but it felt like the way that the EOF header was uh, evolving was partially due to the way that they were written and the anticipation that some things would go on before others. But if we think about them all as the atomic unit now, it feels like it makes more sense to have the code section size just be an array. But and there's like different two two is a repeated field though for functions. Two is a repeated field. Um, 
the code type. Code's repeated, isn't it? I don't, I don't know if I follow. There are, there currently, it's allowed to have multiple code sections and it will still be allowed to have multiple code sections, but in the header of the EOF container, each section is like an individual thing. And so you have the section prefix one code, mm -hmm. and then you have the size of the code. And I am proposing that you have, instead of multiple one prefixes code size, you have a single one prefix for code. And then you have a list of code sizes, each two bytes. And there's two ways you can know the end of that list. It can either be that we enforce there always be a type section header. And so then the size of the type section, you would just divide that by two. And that would be the number of code sections you read, or you could have like a no byte terminator. I mean, aren't, isn't the size field itself fixed length anyway? So you can just divide the size of the, okay, yeah, it's the header. Yeah, I, I think was you also do wondering that if whether you, you want to mix the type and the code. Um, was that discussed? Um, I mean, do you have it in a single header? Yeah, I uh, I, yeah. I kind of proposed that, but I didn't actually dig into like, uh, I think this kind of, I think like technically makes sense, uh, but like we lose that just like this, like one level of abstraction that the, the way the, the EOF headers are defined, like it's very simple that it just, the kind and the size of the content. Um, so the type sections has actually the types in the content and for code, yeah. we can't do it. So yeah, uh, but we can, because like we always require the, the type and the codes go along and we kind of matched. So we can actually combine mm -hmm. these two. Uh, like this, I think number of options you can do it. You can even put the type in the content, like pre prefixing the code. Uh, that's maybe also annoying because now you have to remember that the first two bytes mean something different than the code. Mm. Yeah, I don't know. I think. Yeah, we, it, we it might be better to yeah, keep like, them separate. Yeah, I think there's like multiple options. I didn't actually put a lot of time into it yet. Uh, so yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, I don't know if we can make a decision on that here, but yeah, there's lots of different ways we can do this. I think we should definitely consider, yeah, different, different ways. And I think the important indicator of which ways are better would be like the parsing complexity of it. So it would be great to keep the parsing complexity low and also keep the total size and like, you know, redundant information low. But I would rather have a bit of redundant information if it retains like simplicity of parsing. Okay. Uh, clarify if the data stack has less than caller stack height plus the code sections outputs then execution results in exceptional halt. What happens if the stack height is larger than the number? I don't really understand this one, honestly. I, if the stack height uh, is larger, does it not just return? Yeah. Um... That's a complicated one. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so uh, it's mostly about the read, uh, read f instruction that ends the, the function execution. Mm -hmm. and that, that's related to like the validation as well. Um, but uh, yeah, for this like uh, EOF, functions EAP, we don't have the strict validation yet. So yeah. <laughs> mostly you need to have, uh, uh, in the type you have the number of outputs specified for a function. And so you need at least this number of outputs on the stack when the return F is executed. Um, 
and and the spec says that it has to be at least this number. But if you think about it, you kind of want to keep keep the top top stack items as the output, right? So it seems that return F would need to kind of modify the stack. So only kind of keep the top on and remove the some additional at the bottom or something like that. And mm -hmm. unless we keep it like this and like somehow it goes, <laughs> uh, but I'm not sure, maybe you can discuss it later offline. Uh, or okay. we kind of will go back to this when, if we have time to go to the, to the stack validation because it's kind of repeated there as well. And I think on the strict validation, what we end up ended up with is that we want exactly this number of elements on the stack so far. Um, so we can kind of make it the same restriction here as well. So not like it has to be above or equal, but it has to be precisely equal. And then the implementation is kind of trivial. Yeah, that of course shifts the complexity to us, but it's fine. We've been that, that doing that always, anyways. So yeah, that's that's correct. We're kind of aware of that, uh, but I think the kind of the resolution was to like see how the code generation will handle that, like how bad it will be, and then we can it always should be fine. It. I mean, all the functions we generate so far already have exactly the amount of uh, additional uh, <clears throat> outputs on stack. So it won't make things easier for us, but it will not make it harder than they are before. So. OK, OK. Yeah, that's what I heard. And that's also like the, the next item, which is, I think, yeah. yeah, the same. So I'm sure I explained it well, but I think I can handle like both these cases later with some. OK proposed change okay let's let's do that and just keep going and we can revisit it a bit after you yeah do a little work on it um okay so we'll skip this one too so the next is limit number of functions to 256 so that we can use a single byte immediate for call up that seems okay honestly i just i don't really have a way of making a decision on on that i don't know if anyone has thoughts on why 26 is okay so that would limit total code size to about a meg and a half i think i don't know if that's good or bad oh because of the max code section size yeah i think i did the math wrong let me fix it well meg and a half would be in almost an order of magnitude more than we have now no, no, I think that's the confusion we already discussed. Like the the code size limit kind of wraps all of all of it, like all of the EOF container. I think that's right. What at least we intend. That that well, currently there's the the limit, of course, by the EVM. But for the container, the largest it's actually sixteen megs. The largest possible container would be sixteen. Ah, okay, megs. okay, okay. I, I, I know what you mean. Okay, sorry. Yes. And. Um, 16 megs should be enough for anyone. <laughs> but it does kind of prevent the high hyper optimization of having like a lot of tiny helper functions. I mean, possibly. Um, it, this is yet to be found out with the solidity implementation. You know, how many, how yeah. efficient is it gas wise to split up? Because currently, solidity already has an insane amount of helpers in the code generation. Mm -hmm. And then those are in line and, and potentially reduced and deduplicated currently. Um, but we have to see, you know, what strategy would work the best with the function sections, um, I mean, depending on the, the gas options there. Yeah, deduplication may end up generating small functions in large quantities. So if we end up having deduplication by uh, yeah, block deduplication by generating functions and calling them, even though it's just the tail of a function, actually. But so, yeah, I'm not entirely sure how many functions we will actually end up with on the average in the end. That also depends on the gas price, I would say, uh, if it's efficient or not. Yeah. The current is like... 1,000, right? That's 
I think it's somewhere there. So the it's current still, limit. I think this somewhere. I'm not sure exactly, but I think Andre put a limit on this, like how many number of, but it's 100, 1,024. That's why code sections? Use... Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay. Um, it seems like most people are in favor of this. I will say that like my uninformed take is that 256 feels like a small number. We don't have gas costs specified for call it for return F either, which I think is a question of cost there. Uh, is it not? Five? Ooh, those yep. seem low. I don't know. Yeah, that's like, I think low, as low as we can, but I I expect that it might be controversial to do it this way. Although if, if you- It shouldn't be cheaper than jump. There's no way it should be cheaper than jump. Yeah, it's, it's one more. <laughs> Jump it, jump and jump I are eight and ten. Yeah, but jump exactly. and jump I require the jump test analysis. Right, but you still gotta. You either have to keep all the code in the same memory and change your offset, which you know would be the cheaper way to do it, or load in a new code section in memory. I mean, it's. I think there's a bit more than one gas of work to do for a call, because you also gotta check stack arguments. Do you check stack arguments? Is it not? There's no, I don't, is there checking? I think you just pop it off and then jump to that section because it was validated at deploy. Yeah, you can, you can pre validate True. that. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, let's think about like the gas cost uh, later. Okay. Yeah. But um, I don't know. Like, my, my understanding is like this not strictly in favor. So maybe we keep it as it is for now. Keep it as 1024 for now. No, like the current one, like two bytes immediate. That's, two it's bytes implemented. immediate. As, yeah, that's how yeah. it's implemented already, right? Yeah. So like we don't have to change it if we are not sure and we can look back to this. Some, some other okay. <laughs> uh, all right, we've got 13 minutes left as well, so. Yeah, let's just keep that in mind. We have a couple more things to get to 5450. And I think we should definitely talk about this one since it has some of the most criticism right now. Okay, anyways, reject, jump, jump I, jump dest. I mentioned, I think it might be good to expand the rationale a little bit on this. Just like, what does this really provide? Why I do this, et cetera. But I assume well, everyone's like in favor. That's the, fir the first first moment we can actually do it. Yeah. Uh, because we have replacement and like the benefit is is you don't have to do jump this analysis. Right. I think it'd just be good to say that like explicitly in the EAP just for people who don't have as much context. I think like that's there's no even request for it at the moment. Yeah. I guess, yeah, everyone is on board with that. Yeah, okay. Next one, replace jump desk with no op. It kind of already is a no op. It just happens to be a jump destination. Yeah, I think that's, that's exactly what's like showed up on a discussion somewhere. Uh, so yeah, we can just like instead of actually removing jump this as an invalid, we can kind of reassign it, like change the name. Uh, I think we can consider it offline. And the same for the the PC next one. Like I had it somewhere in the notes. Uh, okay. So you won't you won't be able to observe like where you're on the code. Uh, but we didn't do any like analysis how this is yeah. good or bad. So let's skip it for now. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. Um, reassign EOS section IDs to be in order. That makes sense to me.
Sweet. Uh, make type section mandatory. I think this makes a lot of sense. I think the reason it wasn't mandatory was because of the potential of different things going at different times. But if we are doing them all at once, it seems like extremely unlikely that we'll have a single code section deployed. So there's actually some arguments here. Um, some Charles from Viper left some comments on the Ethereum magicians and also reached out because his comments were not answered and this was from a while back. What he asked uh, was why even enforce a code section for data contracts? Yeah. Um, and you know, in that case, I mean, the type section is, is again, just an overhead, but if you have a single code section, the type section definitely is an overhead. Um, well, it depends on the validation, right? Um, it depends on the next section here. Um, but also this discussion, whether we're going to have the type information in the code section or not. Yeah, I think there's a lot of questions around this in, in any case. Um, yeah. But the, the optimizer community definitely would ask, you know, why you have this if it's not used? Uh, I think it doesn't really matter in terms of uh, like validation because we just have like implicit type there, like for the. So it's, I think it's like rather ma matter of encoding this information, but doesn't really change how it behaves. What's the and best no, way to... There's no plan to make down. blob space accessible from inside the EVM, right? No. Okay. So there's still an argument for data contracts. But is it really that big of a deal to have a single byte in the code section? I mean, the extra overheads like five bytes total probably seven well, and it's seven it is so it, it makes the parsing simpler because you don't have multiple cases yeah this information is available to, to, to contracts if they want to parse it because they can access the bytes with that mm -hmm. What's the best way to make a more informed decision on this? Like, do we really need to like sketch out the different approaches at this point and just see, compare them and see if anything falls out of that? Or are there other things that if we answered, this wouldn't become clearer? I mean, all they're fighting for is like what, 28 gas or? If it's zeros mostly, you're fighting for less than that gas with respect to contract deployment, right? Yeah, oh, deployment's 200 to byte too. So, but still, we're talking about small amounts of gas we're trying <clears> to optimize. Okay, I think like I can maybe write up a couple of different approaches for doing this, unless somebody else would rather do that, and then we can compare them. Okay. I mean, I'm personally in favor of uh, having it more strict to make parsing easier, so optimizing for runtime um cost yeah uh, at the expense of the storage cost um but you know maybe there's something which can be also plotted at other client devs which is more important are they do they really want to optimize for um you know storage cost in instead from like a client perspective yeah i think i'm on the same page as you so i can write a couple different ways of doing that and look at the differences a bit. And yeah, let's talk about it again later. Okay, uh, clarify the 1024 stack limit still applies. I think that this makes sense. And yeah, just a simple change to 4750, just clarification. 
Okay, six minutes, 5450 stack validation. Uh, yeah, this I've heard the most criticism about. Like, obviously, right now, it's not something that people are considering as much as part of this, like, full EOF suite. I realize that probably everyone's call feels differently and, like, we want to do this. But, uh, yeah, it's not considered for the next DevNet right now. And Martin has probably been the loudest person who's had criticism of this specification and how ready it is, et cetera. So I don't know if people have thoughts on that. Uh, just a quick question. Um, if we don't, if we don't end up cleaning the stack uh, on a terminating instruction, where are we going to store the data that's located on the stack? Um, actually, I didn't didn't understand the question. <laughs> yeah, I, I the way I understood the question is like the stack elements just still exist from the like parent call frame, and there's no need to clean them up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so like maybe quickly explain uh, when you when you call a, a function, then you get like the subset of the stack space available. And and the idea is that when the function returns, it has exactly it leaves on this this stack subsec subsection exactly the number of items that is specified in the function type. So the caller know yeah. exactly how much items will be on the stack after the call. It's not a guess. It's like kind of explicit, and it's a matter if this is verified um, deploy time or it's checked at runtime, but the behavior is kind of a bit more strict. Yeah. Uh, one point I wanted to mention is that I think, you know, with respect to Martin, something that would make him feel better about these things is if we had more motivation for 5450 in terms of what you can do with compilation because he generally feels that 5450 probably isn't worth it if like the only thing it's doing is reducing the number of checks in the interpreter loop for underflow overflow and so if we can provide some motivation that this makes things better in you know future worlds that would probably alleviate his concerns for that so something to consider. I mean, the biggest sell is for future jitting, but right. um, that's, you know, Greg's, you know, not in favor of jitting because he feels there's concern for logic bombs, but I think a single linear analysis will remove a lot of the logic bombs. Um, there's always, you know, multimodal interpretation too. You can mix your compilation and your interp your jitting code at the same time. Um, but I mean, there's also the, the, some people feel like, especially in the move community, that the speed of the interpreter is secondary to data access. So there's, we're also fighting upstream against that. Yeah. But is, is there anything other than future jitting that we could, and stack reduction that we could pitch for that? No, I don't, I don't think there's like much more to, to find here. It's like, it simplifies the, the the interpreter at runtime, but the the the, the whole performance gains are not really big. Mm -hmm. And uh, and like my kind of like different think thinking about is that we we do need to to do uh, code validation anyway, and right. this adds additional pass to like to to more validation. And this is it's a bit like like I kind of feel like. How, how much we can push it. And this seems to be like the final step. Uh, I don't see anything above that, uh, but we yeah, understand this concerns. Maybe it's not worth it, but I, I think it's like either we get it here or like we will not be able to do it anyway uh, in the yeah. future. 
So because is this if something... it doesn't go in the, in the first shoot, like it's definitely not worth it to introduce it later, like to have the contracts that <clears throat> has to obey it and the contracts that doesn't have to obey it because they right. are you have one. Um, but yeah, okay. And yeah, I did I did put like a new revision of that. Like it has the text spec, so it doesn't have to follow Python code. Um, and I like if you really do it well. Uh, I feel like I'm kind of advocating for it, but uh, <laughs> that's not my intention. But you can kind of replace the the previous EIP with only this one. But that's that's mostly like how to organize the specification for it. Yep. Okay, guys, we're at the top of the hour. Any final comments, questions, things that we need to be thinking about before ACB this week, next week? Can we add more restrictions to stack validation? Um, I can draft up a, a doc for it, but if we could require that any instruction following a terminal instruction um, must have been referenced by a prior jump. You know, we could wordsmith it. Um, we can do single pass and we can do dead code checking too. And we could do all this validation in one loop and pass through it once and get all this. Okay. Yeah, I mean, if you want to write something for that, I think that would be great. I don't, yeah, I don't have enough context to know how likely okay. something like that is, but it sounds useful okay thanks a lot everybody this was helpful thanks a lot pavel alex for coming up with the list of open issues um yeah still a little bit of work to do i'll uh, oh i guess like one other thing is that mario vega has been working on some more cross client tests uh i can post the link in the discord evm discord channel so if you are a client developer implementing this, there will be some more tests coming out soon. Um, yeah, anyways, looking forward to hearing the outcome of your guys' conversation with Solidity. And yeah, let's ch keep chatting in the EVM channel. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you much. You. Bye, all. Thanks. Bye. Have a great one. You too.